Let me tell you why you should listen to this episode today. Because according to Ezekiel 26, 1, this prophecy was given on the first day of the 11th month of the 12th year of Nebuchadnezzar. And according to my, I couldn't tell you when that was, except according to my commentaries, that means it was January 8th of 585 BC. I am releasing this episode on Monday, January 8th of 2024 AD. And so it's to the same calendar day, just many thousands of years later. I'm actually releasing this study today on the 2608th birthday of this specific prophecy. And so today is a really, really good day to listen to this podcast. And if you missed it on premiere day and just found your way along here later, then, well, you're late, but hang around anyway, because this, this actually begins our study of one of the most important chapters of the Bible. Ezekiel 28 is not only one of the strangest chapters in the Bible, it's also one of the most important. Ezekiel 28 is one of the two chapters that gives the most backstory on the devil. Now, today we are going to talk a little bit about the devil, but we're not focusing on him first. We're going to talk about the person who is used to introduce the devil, and that is the king of Tyre, a guy that you're probably not too familiar with because he lived 2,608 years ago. In Ezekiel 28, God uses the king of Tyre to introduce Satan. And so as we read about the king of Tyre, we're going to start to see parallels between him and Satan. It says that he's very prideful, that he wants to replace the true God. But then it also, it says that he's very wise. That this evil king, he, he is a guy full of wisdom and understanding, but he's still a bad guy. Like a really, really, really bad guy. So why is the Bible also complimenting his wisdom? I find all of that to be weird, and I would like to find out why it's in the Bible. And you're going to learn all about that today on the Cross References podcast and the Weird Stuff in the Bible podcast. Welcome to a crossover episode between two different podcasts, Weird Stuff in the Bible and Cross References. So on my Cross References podcast, we learn how each small part of the Bible, it's telling one big story, and we're also going through the book of Ezekiel. And this is a very weird chapter of Ezekiel, and so as I'm working my way through it, I decided that I might do one or two joint episodes with my other podcast, Weird Stuff in the Bible. That's a, pas that's a podcast where we delve into passages that are bizarre, perplexing, or just plain weird. And so if I'm doing a crossover, what I mean is I'm going to release this episode on both of those podcasts on the same week. And, um, and I have to balance a couple of conflicting pro priorities whenever I do this, because cross references that's a verse-by-verse -verse comprehensive study. Weird Stuff in the Bible is a fast-paced, punchy, different type of format of podcast. Uh, but since I'm only covering about 10 verses today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be both. And so, hey, let's get into it, guys. Turn to Ezekiel 28, and let's get weird. As you're turning there, I'll mention my voice is just about all back. I was sick there for a couple weeks, and so I kind of took a week off from putting out episodes, which I, I hated to do that, but um, it was circumstances beyond my control because I was a little bit under the weather. And so this week, it's just one episode because it's one episode for both podcasts. I'm just getting out this one episode this week and should be back next week, full blast with, with both podcasts returning. So, um, okay. Verses 1 through 10 of Ezekiel 28, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the context first. This is a section of Ezekiel where he's giving prophecies to uh, about the Gentile nations that are surrounding Israel, and none of them are doing a great job. <laughs> These are all prophecies of judgment, and so for the past couple of chapters, it's really been focusing on Tyre, and that was a wealthy harbor nation with its capital that was on an island in the Mediterranean Sea, and this uh, was such an economically powerful and physically formidable uh, nation that they thought that they were indestructible. They were quite small, but they thought they were, they were just such a powerhouse economically and all that. And because of their physical location, they thought that they were indestructible. They thought that since they had so many other nations depending on them, they would never have to worry about anyone coming against them. And God is going to show Tyre that that was wrong. And he addresses its leadership right here in chapter 28. So verses 1 through 10, it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Let me go ahead and break in right here. And I'm going to do that often because the, this is the short, punchy Bible study, like I said. So the prince of Tyre, it's not the word prince that's used um, the way that you probably normally think of the word prince. 
You know, prince usually means the next in command or the son of the king. He's called the prince. Well, the prince that's right here is the king. Prince is just a word in the Bible that means the first, like the one in charge. And so this is addressed to the literal king of Tyre, a human king. And there's going to be some stuff about Satan in this chapter too. That's going to come later. We're going to get to that actually on next week's program. But um, anyway, we'll just continue for now. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God. You are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. By your wisdom and your understanding, you have made wealth for yourself. You have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in your trade, you have increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. As I was saying before, Tyre here, they thought they were so powerful that they were indestructible. And this was pride. And the king felt like he was a god among men. He probably had like this massive throne, you know, it referred to it here as uh, the seat of the gods. And the king's name, he, he's not mentioned in this chapter, but we actually know who he was from historical records. His name was Ethbal III. That's a very interesting name because of some stuff that's going to come up later in this chapter. B- Baal or Baal. He is Satan. And the name Ethbal or Ethbaal, it means literally Baal is with him. And so the king is essentially named Satan is with me. And I am certain that this part of the chapter is talking about the human ruler of Tyre, but we just see a lot of parallels to Satan in the description. And that's why God is using this guy to actually teach us something about Satan. And we're going to learn some of that stuff today. One more thing I want to mention before I go on is that Daniel was brought up right here in verse three. That's where it said Ethbel was wiser than Daniel. That is quite a claim. You know, if you read the book of Daniel, you see that Daniel was actually an incredibly wise guy from a very young age. The source of Daniel's wisdom was his confidence and his faith in God. And that guides Daniel through some of really treacherous waters throughout his book, some very difficult and fearful situations. But Daniel escapes time and time again, really just kind of by the skin of his teeth. And it was his wisdom and decision-making that did it. And then here you have this evil, wicked king of Tyre, a man who parallels Satan in the flesh, and God declares him to be wiser than even Daniel. Now, that's such a strange thing to say, and he's going to say it again. Verse 6, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you make your heart like the heart of a God, therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, there's that word again, and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a man and no God, in the hands of those who would slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. So this man thought himself to be godlike because of his great power. And God is saying, you're going to be brought down just like anybody else. You will die. You'll end up in the underworld. You'll be brought down to the pit of hell. You'll lie among the commoners, the uncircumcised, the average Joes, the people you thought you were just so far above. You're going to be lying with them forever. You know, death is the great equalizer. Um, No matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, whatever your position is in this world. Guess what, guys? A hundred years from now, we're all dead and none of it matters. The only thing that matters is your eternal soul. It's like Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? And we see here that for the king of Tyre, he's going to learn that lesson the hard way. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are not a follower of God, you're going to lose it all in the end. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for Christ will save it. It was often said in America that whoever is the president is not only the leader of the United States. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I'm laughing as I'm saying this. <laughs> um, I, I was watching a video of our current president, President Biden, on my phone yesterday, and he was trying to get off the airplane and was like confused and lost, trying to find his way. And uh, <laughs> my son came over, he's four, and he, he came over and asked who that man was, stumbling around on my phone, and uh, I told him it's the most powerful man in the world. So that's, and that's kind of the point that I was building up to here. It just made me think of that story from yesterday. But the um, it is said that whoever is president is not just the leader of the United States, 
but the leader of the world. Because the leader of the most powerful nation in the world, somewhat you could say he's the most powerful man in the world. I don't know if they still say that anymore these days, but that is certainly something that used to be said about the president of the United States, and it may very well have been true. Whoever's the president is the most powerful man in the world. And the same thing was probably said back in those days about the, the whoever was leading Tyre. You know, Tyre, it was not the largest in size, not the largest in population, but it was perhaps the economic hub of the world. We talked about that in a recent lesson on the Cross References podcast. Perhaps, perhaps it was said that whoever controlled Tyre controlled the world. And maybe that was true for those days. But God is saying here that that person is going to die just like any other man would die. And so, so we kind of covered what the verses say here. Let's get back to the weird thing. And that's the main focus of today's lesson. He's not only called prideful and evil. He's called someone who calls himself a god. But he's also called wise. Now, what is that all about? You know, we don't, we don't often go around calling our enemies complimentary names like this. But God says it four times in this section, verses three, four, five, and seven. Why is there this emphasis on the wisdom of this evil guy? How could someone be considered wise when they don't even submit to God? Well, to understand this, let's first define wisdom. Wisdom is an understanding of how the world works. God created this universe to operate to according to certain principles— like God created human beings, God created society, God created the laws of physics, God created logic, and God integrated all these things. And so if you understand how humans and society and logic work, you could have a deep, holistic understanding of how the world works. And that is what wisdom is. It's understanding how the world works. Proverbs chapter 3 says that God made wisdom and then God made the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means God decided beforehand how all these things are supposed to operate, and then God made the world in accordance with those principles. And those principles are very hard to figure out, actually. Now, some t- oftentimes, older people have more wisdom than younger people, and that's because they have a lot of life experience. If they've been on this world a certain amount of time and paying attention to it, they garner wisdom because they gain a deeper understanding of how the world works. Young people often think older people are, you know, out of touch that, you know, they because older people don't always jump on board with the latest technology or the latest fad. But, you know, in reality, fads come and go. The principles that undergird reality, those stay the same. And that is where wisdom is found. And so understanding how to work the latest cell phone, that's not something that makes you wise. Understanding the principles of how the world works, that is wisdom. So I'm going to get into um, the real thing I want you to take away from today's lesson. I want to tell you what wisdom is not. Wisdom is not virtue. Okay, pause this podcast and process that for a minute if that's a hard concept for you to understand. Somebody could be very, very wise in the ways of the world, and they are not necessarily going to be a virtuous person. All right, so in other words... There's a lot of wicked people out there who have a deeper understanding of how this world works than you do. Being wiser will not necessarily make you good. It just makes you a little bit more equipped for success in life. But wisdom alone, that is not going to make you a better person in a moral sense. It's not going to make you a more godly person. And, And I can demonstrate that with a few very evil people in the Bible who are described as wise. Solomon was often called the wisest man in the Bible. And perhaps he was. But if you notice that Solomon was also pretty loose with his morals, 1 Kings 11, it says, Now Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. What's the Bible saying? I, that was from um, 1 Kings 11. It's saying there, Solomon, despite all his wisdom, he had major problems whenever it came to the opposite sex. He knew what was right, but he didn't have the self-control to do what was right. And these women were all from nations that didn't follow after God. So when Solomon married them, they had a huge influence on him 
and caused him to turn away from God. And, and he did all this in the name of love. I'm sure he did love them. I mean, it says he did. So I believe he truly loved them. But that doesn't make it okay to marry a bunch of wives or to marry wives from countries that you're not supposed to marry them from. Like, love is not an excuse to commit sin. It's not an excuse to change God's rules concerning marriage, okay? <laughs> That's a lesson our society needs to learn. You know, they'd say love wins when they change the laws of marriage. Um, love is not a good enough reason. It's not an excuse to commit sin. Verse 9 of that chapter. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel. So what I'm saying here, guys, is we know that Solomon was wise, but wisdom is not enough. Wisdom is not virtue. You need to have virtue paired with wisdom. That's the difference in merely knowing the right thing and doing the right thing. Uh, someone else who is called wise in the Bible is the devil. Yeah, you heard me, right? <laughs> if, you, if, you thought you, if you thought I said that wrong, I did not say it wrong. I said it right. The devil. This is why I'm putting this episode on weird stuff in the Bible as well, because it's weird to me that the devil is referred to as wise. That sounds a bit complimentary, right? To call the devil a wise being. Like, it, it, this is God's enemy, his arch rival. I mean, who, how, he's someone who's dumb enough to pick a fight with God. How wise could he be, right? Well, God tells us he's actually very wise. In Ezekiel 28, 12, this is the same chapter that we looked at the first 10 verses of today, okay? Remember how we studied that, that evil king of Tyre, and yet we kept hearing again and again how wise he was. And then in the next section, it, it talks about the devil, and it talks about him in the same glowing terms. It says, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Wow, so it's like the devil was really wise. He was full of wisdom, and yet he still got himself kicked out of heaven. Verse 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. So here's what I'm saying, guys. Wisdom is not enough. You can be full of wisdom and end up getting yourself kicked out of heaven. So you need more than just wisdom if you want to make it to heaven. What you need is godliness. You need the righteousness of Christ. Wisdom is about knowing how to be successful. And listen, guys, even evil people could be successful. Evil people can get elected president. Evil people can become millionaires and billionaires. They can influence thousands or millions of people, and they, they might be very wise. That doesn't make them virtuous. In fact, the guy who is going to become the most powerful man in the world in the end times, the most evil person in all of human history before or after, the guy who's going to make Hitler look like an afterthought, I, the, I'm talking about the Antichrist himself right here, he is described as having a deeper wisdom than even the most wise people. In a prophecy in Daniel 8, 23 and 24, it says, And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. So it says right here, he can understand dark riddles, or it might say he is a master of intrigue. And these are ways of saying that he understands the most complicated aspects of wisdom and human thought. The Antichrist, it's who it's talking about right there, he is going to be a very wise person. The Antichrist is going to be successful in just about everything that he undertakes. In fact, he's going to be capable of doing what even the devil cannot do today. He's going to be successful against the saints. You know, in modern times, um, we, you know, we call this the, the church age. And Jesus said that for the church, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. But the church age is going to end. And those who get saved during the tribulation, they do not have that promise of protection. They're going to be saved, but the Antichrist will prevail against them. So he is still incredibly evil, but he's also incredibly wise. Solomon, the devil, and the Antichrist... They are all wiser than you are. And yet they still had major moral problems. 
So don't think that wisdom is enough. You can't just chase wisdom. You should chase wisdom, but that is not enough. You must also, and first, chase virtue. Become a good person, follow God's commandments, build your moral character, and add to that wisdom. Now, I don't know how you came across this podcast, um, if you were already subscribed to it or if you just stumbled across it. But guys, I'm pleading with you, make sure that you're subscribed on both of these podcasts, Weird Stuff in the Bible and the Cross References podcast. I'm going to be equipping you to combat the devil this month. And it starts today. It starts right here in this lesson. Have you ever considered the concept that the devil is smarter than you, that he's more powerful than you, that he is actually wiser than you? You know, like I said, maybe you've had the thought, how smart could he be? You know, if he picked a fight with God, if he thought he could take God's throne, like, you got to be pretty dumb to do that, right? Well, that might be an overly simplistic view of the whole situation that we find ourselves in. The devil is actually exceedingly wise. He has thousands of years of observing humanity, thousands of years of data that he brings to the table whenever it comes to tempting humans and causing them to fall. So... Maybe he's a little bit smarter than you are. All right, think of the wisest person that you know. The first person that you would go to for advice. They, they probably aren't 100 years old yet. And yet the devil has been observing how this world works for thousands of years. He's thousands of years wiser than that person. And he's definitely wiser than you. And when it comes to doing battle against the devil, the Bible never tells us to rely on our own smarts, on our own mind, on our own power to defeat him. The Bible says if you do that, you're going to fail every time. He will chew you up and spit you out. If you want to defeat the devil, you have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. James 4.2, it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So how do you resist the devil? You submit to God. You, he, you won't be able to resist him if you don't first submit. Because you operate in the physical sphere, but the devil, he's operating in the spiritual sphere. But we have a God who is sovereign over both of those spheres. And if you rely on him, then you become more powerful than the devil. Neither his power nor his wisdom can overcome you, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail. And if you think you're wise enough to overcome the devil on your own, you'll lose. And if you think that's weird, let me just say, it's not the Bible that's weird. We are weird. Because we didn't know that the devil was wise, even wiser than we are. But now we do. Thanks for listening. God bless you for sticking around till the end. And I hope the Bible makes more sense to you after this episode.